we can start. Uh, so I have the, the pleasure to introduce Alexandre, who's coming all the way from Chamonix, uh, next to the Mont Blanc. Uh, so Alexandre is a pro mountain and adventure photographer. And uh, so he has, I think, written three books on photography. And, uh, and yeah, he has a past doing computer science. Uh, and uh, yeah, Alexandre will present some, some of his work. So. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Alexandre Buis, as you cannot see because it's very dark red, uh, just about Photos from the Edge. And the talk is uh, titled Photos from the Edge, and I do apologize, as promised, for it. Uh, I'm giving the same talk in London in a week, and they chose the title for me. Um, so this is what I used to be doing, and there seems it's, yeah, OK, there's kind of a delay there. Um, up until about two and a half years ago, something like that. Uh, and I managed to get out. Uh, and this is what I do now, and there is a sizable delay. There you go. Um, yeah, so this is now the kind of stuff that I'm doing, and I'm, I'm having a lot more fun doing. Uh, for instance, hanging on, on a fixed line 300 meters up the deck in Verdun, uh, shooting people rock climbing, or climbing myself. And this is going to get annoying. There you go. Uh, <clears throat> or climbing myself, so this is uh, in Patagonia. And that's one of the big things about the career I'm doing is that I'm shooting people climbing, but I also have to climb myself and to ski myself and to paraglide and to do almost all of those sports I have to do myself. Um, and this is another kind of adventure that I'm, I'm doing, uh, kind of combining it all together, climbing up, skiing a bit down, and then, then flying down. And so I'm trying to have as many adventures as possible. Uh, this was, for instance, paragliding of the summit of Dôme du Goûter. Uh, we were trying for Mont Blanc, but uh, the winds were too high on the summit of Mont Blanc. Um, and this is, yeah, it's pretty uh, hardcore on my on my climbing gear. Uh, I, I won't get too technical uh, in this talk. I wasn't quite sure what, what you guys were expecting, um, so I'm not going to be giving maybe specific photography advice, rather more talking about what the, the lifestyle is like and what the, the shoots are like. Um, but yeah, this is what happens to, uh, to my camera on a sadly frequent, fairly frequent basis, and my insurance company really hates me. Um, there we go. Uh, so that's, of course, the most beautiful place in the world. Uh, and it's so much better than Switzerland. Um, this is, uh, of course, Chamonix. With, uh, so Mont Blanc is, I don't know if I can. Yeah, I can't really point. Um, but Mont Blanc is, is very close. I actually shot that. This is a panoramic picture of about 12 different images that I shot while uh, while flying down from uh, Vallée Blanche. And uh, this is where I am lucky enough to live. And so it's great because um, Chamonix hub for all the, the old um, sports people, all uh, mountaineers. Um, so I can find very easily athletes uh, to to go shoot, and I can very easily go on adventures myself. And the access that you get in, in Chamonix is unbelievable because you have a couple of lifts that get you pretty high up, that get you up here, and then another one gets you almost at the same altitude on the, on the Grand Monte side. Um, so I can wake up in my bed at 8 AM, go take the first bin, have a full on adventure climbing or skiing or flying, and then be back down in time to have some beer. And I have, as Benoit said, I've written three books uh, so far. So the first two, uh, the second one is actually an e-book, uh, but the first two were published a couple of years ago, uh, 2011 mostly, and um, they, they are dealing with the um, technical uh, side of, um, of taking pictures in mountain. And the third one was published just a couple of months ago in last October. Uh, I'm pleased to say that it's actually, uh, the first print run is exhausted, so it sold really well. Um, I actually have a copy here that you're welcome to uh, take a look afterwards. Uh, and I'm going to leave it with Benoit anyway, so you can hand him. And this is new. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody but you so far about it. It's coming out soon, and it's uh, a book for geeks. Um, it's, it's an e-book, actually, and it's about all the boring-ish uh, things that you have to do with uh, digital photography and all dealing with files and editing and all that sort of thing coming out soon. All right, so the way I think this is going to work is I'm going to walk you through a couple of my recent shoots and, and kind of talk about what they wanted me to, um, what the clients wanted me to do with the images, uh, what challenges I had, and 
you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of images I managed to produce and the stories behind them. Um, and I'll try to leave about 15, 20 minutes for questions at the end, but please feel free to interrupt me uh, if you have any, anything that you want to know. <clears throat> so the first one is on the Eiger Nordmann, and I was last, uh, last August. And what happened is that this guy, um, this guy, yeah, this guy, uh, he's called Callum Muscat, he's not even 20, uh, and he's one of the, um, he's an extremely talented rock climber and an alpinist, and he's studying to be a mountain guide. And I hadn't actually met him, but I knew he was in the Alps, so I just sent him an email saying basically, you know, if you're gonna climb something cool and you want pictures of it, let me know, and I'll be happy to tag along. And I didn't hear anything, and then uh, I had plans to go climbing in Chamonix and do whatever I do, and then uh, I got an email from this guy saying, I'm going to be with Dave McLeod. We're in Grindelwald right now. We are going to try to climb Paciencia in two days. You're welcome to come if you want. And Paciencia is currently the hardest route on the northwest of the Aiga. It has an eight-day crux pitch, and it's just ridiculously long and, and involved, and it has only been climbed twice. Um, so I said, sure, and I came along. Uh, <clears throat> and what you need to know about the Aiga, uh, besides that it's a very big, very scary mountain, um, is that there is a train that actually goes to, I mean, it goes to Jungfrau Joch, which is further away, but it goes through the north face. And so this is not quite the north face. This is the north face that's kind of a small buttress. Um, but you have about a third of the way up the north face a window into the railway. Um, and that's called the Stollenloch. And what people can do often is get dropped off by the train and then exit, and you just keep the bottom third of the face, which is dangerous, loose, and not very interesting because it's low angle. And that's also where the, the route starts. So we're hoping to do that, but it turns out we're not, uh, we're not Swiss because I'm French and those guys are British. And uh, so the, <coughs> the railway wouldn't let us because you have to be Swiss to be let out. It's amazing. Uh, so we had to climb uh, from the bottom. And those guys made two carries um, up to the, the BV site at the Stollenloch. And, um, so they were fairly light, but I had two pro cameras, two big lenses, my entire BV kit because I was going to sleep there, and then uh, 70 meters of rope that I could ascend. So it's a pretty sizable backpack, and that's the kind of terrain that, that we were on. So it's not ridiculously hard, like we're not roped up because you can't really uh, put protection in, um, and those guys are not even in climbing boots, but it's still you know steep, loose, and, um, and dangerous, basically. Um, and what happened shortly after I took this picture is that I broke a handhold and uh, I started pitching back and managed to catch myself at the, at the last second. I kind of saw my life flash in front of my eyes and those guys had to come down and throw me a rope and help me and take my backpack because I was too scared uh, to actually keep going. Um, but anyway, we got to the Stollenloch and to the PV site and um, so that, that's a an interesting point, I think, with this picture, because it is not a good picture. It is, at best, a passable picture. Um, but it tells a story, um, and it kind of, if you start from the first picture of the guy in the train, and you go all the way to the, the amazing picture, hopefully, that, uh, that I capture at the end, um, you can get a complete story of what it's like to actually climb this thing, instead of you know, just seeing the amazing picture and saying, yeah, cool, and then you know, not having any idea of what's actually involved in climbing something that big. Um, <clears throat> so I have to build a story and I have to also try to capture all those moments that are not visually that interesting, but that help build the story. And that's, you know, going up fixed lines uh, with a lot of equipment. Um, and then, of course, you try, you try your best to make it slightly less passable or sl slightly better picture by, you know, playing with uh, focus and foregrounds and stuff like that. And it's not a, a picture that's designed to stand by itself but uh, it, it helps move the story along, hopefully. And um, so yeah, I had spent all that time and effort and, and nearly died uh, trying to get there uh, to have the pictures of those guys climbing with amazing backdrop, you know, crazily exposed. And of course we get there, they finally start climbing and the fog, the fog rolls in. And that's, you know, you kind of, you have to roll with it. And it's in cases like that where the route that they're climbing is, because they're actually climbing it for real. Um, and I'm just along for the ride, so I can't ask them to, you know, wait, wait half an hour for the fog to, to dissipate or do that again. You can't do that. So you have to make do with the best you have and, and kind of roll with it. And in that case, I, I think, I, I hope that it adds an atmospheric effect 
And anyway, didn't really have any choice. Question, how did you get involved? So um, on this route, uh, you have, so those are the first hard pitches and the 7C pitches. Um, and there are fixed lines already in place from other teams that are working on a route just to the side of it. So it was very lucky in that sense. Otherwise, what I would do is that on, on really hard routes like that, they usually rehearse the moves. So they would climb it the first time and then carry my, my rope uh, behind them. And they wouldn't manage to actually climb it in one go. They would have to rest in between. Then they would fix my rope and I would go up and then uh, I would shoot them from above while they're actually going for the, for the lead. And that's what happened on the ATA pitch. They means technically you're doing exactly the same that they do. No, because I, I cannot climb that hard, uh, you know, especially with cameras and stuff. So when they are climbing super hard routes like that, super hard um, pitches like that, I'm just jugging on a fixed rope. I'm, I'm ascending a rope, uh, thankfully. Um, so yeah, that's a, another example of, of uh, this, this um, image, this atmospheric image with the, with the fog. And that's another thing. Um, that you try sometimes to focus. If you can have the wide angle picture with the crazy uh, crazy exposure and crazy landscape above, then you kind of try to zoom in and see, um, try to express what it takes to climb at this level. And I think this is where facial expressions are key because you cannot really convey how steep a wall is. This is actually overhanging by like 20 degrees, but you wouldn't know it. And th the holes are always tiny and you're used to seeing tiny holes. So it really doesn't bring much. But if you see somebody making crazy uh, grimace and, and really showing in his face how hard it is to climb, then hopefully that, that's how you convey the, the message to the, to the viewer. And I think personally that this image works well for that. Um, right? And that's coming up. There you go. So that's uh, another example. This is not uh, you won't get that picture as cover of a catalog or you know as cover of a magazine, but this is an important picture nonetheless because it tells the story of you know you have to spend nights there and you have to carry all your stuff there and you have equipment everywhere and you're beaving, uh, it's cold, uh, but but they're still smiling, and that's also something that you know they were always having fun and I was trying to convey that through through my pictures. And again, another picture that hopefully. Is, um, helps tell the story of this is super, super steep. And this is hard work getting up there. Um, even though it's not on its own, it's not a great picture. And so on this one, uh, things start to get real. There you go. Um, and this is, that's not even, a, it's a picture I'm showing here, but I, I don't even, didn't even show it to the client, but just to give an idea of what it's like. And you have gear everywhere, equipment everywhere, ropes kind of in nuts everywhere. Um, but you spent all that time and energy getting there. And that's, that's when it really starts. How much of this was free climb? Oh, they free climbed 100%. So that's the, the whole point. It took eight, year, eight years for this route to be free, cli free climbed the first time by Uli Steck. Uh, he's the one who opened it. Um, <clears throat> and so this, this picture is, um, so in that case, they had rehearsed the, the pitch. That's the AT pitch, the crux pitch I had come to shoot. Uh, and I was hanging on my fixed line. And then here, Dave um, is not quite, I mean, he's pulling a rope there. So I can actually quite see his feet. And there's a rule in climbing photography that you have to see the eyes and you have to see both hands and both feet for the, for the picture to work. So in that sense, the picture doesn't really work because you can see his feet. Uh, but you can still see his face. And then you have this whole thing going on with the, um, uh, with the background out of focus. That, and the background that takes so much of the, of the image. And um, so at this stage, I couldn't really shoot a typical classical good uh, climbing image. So what I did is just try to experiment with uh, different compositions um, and to tell a different story than just, you know, this is hard. Um, and so to you whether that actually worked. Yeah. So you said, you mentioned the rules and stuff. Yeah. Um, I wonder, is there a rule for in which phase of the move you shoot? Like everything attached or just before they like move? It, it completely depends. And that's where actually being a climber yourself is going to help greatly because you, you'll be able to anticipate what's going on. Um, there's no, I don't, I don't think there's a rule. Uh, usually if you can show movement, it's much better. But it's often uh, you will get a better suggestion of movement if somebody's, for instance, um, you can see that he's readying to move and that he's in a position that where he's going to jump rather than if he's actually mid-jump, sometimes he doesn't actually look that good. Uh, 
but I'm not aware, at least, of, of any rule uh, about that. Um, and so, yeah, that's now we're getting to the um, to the image that I had come to shoot. And here, this one is almost there, and that's Callum uh, at the top of the ATA pitch. Um, and you can see two hands, two feet, the eyes. Um, you can get a small idea of the angle. And then you have something really interesting. You don't even see Dave because he's playing below the roof, but you can see the rope. And it, because I'm shooting very wide angle, uh, it gives the impression that the rope goes on forever. And that's a 50 meter speech already. Uh, and then you can kind of see that the wall is keeps on just keeps on going. So I kind of really like this picture, but this one, yeah. So for example, for this one, you are just pushing with your feet out from the wall. Yeah. I'm going to mention that if, yeah, there you go. Uh, this looks really ugly. Okay. Um, I'm going to, to talk about that just now because um, here, this is for me the picture from the shoot, um, and the clients agree. And for that actual picture, I, I'm very far away from the wall, as you can see. And this is, of course, sometimes people bring ladders to push themselves away. Obviously, there wasn't an option here. Uh, so what happened is that this is actually crazily overhanging, maybe 25 degrees. And I was, my, my rope was anchored at the top. And then it was, I was clipped through one of the quick draws on the route, um, the one just above the one where he's climbing right now. And that meant that, of course, when Dave came, he had to use that quick draw and, and, and keep on climbing. So I had to let go of it. And when I let go, I just took a huge pendulum. And when I was out five or six meters at the apex, I shot. And then what happened is that, you know, I'm, I have the, the, the blowback of the pendulum, and I'm just starting to slam back. And I'm slamming back into Dave, who's climbing the, the, this super hard route. So I was like, like that, trying to be as, uh, as thin as possible. And I just ba barely grazed him and then went back for my pendulum and did that a couple of times. Um, no, no, I, I just never look on the display. I look on the display when I'm back home. <laughs> and uh, and that's also super important as a climbing photographer is to always, well, to never disturb the climbers because they, they trust me not to bother them, not to be a presence that, that they will have to spend time and energy and that, I mean, the worst thing could possibly do besides injure them would be to make them fall, especially when they're climbing something that hard. Um, so it, it's really, um, sometimes you have to let go of the picture. You have to not take a picture so that you won't be in the way. Um, Tell us a little bit about the technical piece about this particular photograph. So as in, what kind of oh, this is, so this is a wide angle. I like to shoot very wide. Uh, this is on a, that's a Nikon D800. Uh, and that's a, the lens is a 1635 f4, which is my go-to lens because it's fairly light. Um, and then you can see everything is in focus. So I was actually, I think at f11. Um, and uh, pre-focused at about two meters, so that I don't even have to other focus. And I'm always shooting in aperture priority. So in that case, I don't even have to put the camera to my eye, really. Uh, I mean, I, I usually try to, but sometimes I'm, I have to, there's too much going on for me too. So I just get an idea of where I'm framing and just shooting. And I, I don't fiddle with the settings ever. How far are you uh, I, I think. Yeah, something like five or six meters out of so the wall. So you focus at two, two or thereabouts? Yeah, because with, with a hyperfocal hyper distance at f11, especially at 16 millimeters, everything will be in focus. Yeah. And sometimes, of course, especially when I'm shooting long, I really try to have shallow depth of field and shoot at f2.8, usually, to, um, to really separate, create some separation. But, uh, but when I'm shooting wide, usually it's very rare that, that you would uh, try to get shallow depth of field shooting wide. You try to get everything in focus. And after that picture, shortly afterwards, they took two more days to climb, and I absolutely down and went through the Stollenloch, hitchhiked on the train, and had a big rush tea. There you go. Uh, so that was the first, um, the first shoot. The second one uh, actually happened just 10 days ago. And the story was uh, through some too long to explain circumstances. I met the, the editor from uh, Sports Illustrated which is one of the, uh, the biggest magazines in the world. In the States, it's three and a half million readership, I think. Um, and they usually are all about like the Super Bowl yesterday and the baseball and basketball and that kind of thing. So they're not really into adventure stuff. But um, the editor wanted to give me a chance to, um, to shoot some adventure for them. 
and uh, I suggested different number of things, and they decided to go with uh, ice climbing at night using big studio flashes. Um, <clears throat> and this is, yep, no, there we go. So this is what my assistant was supposed to be carrying for me, and this is, and it turned out that there was no assistant because one of the models dropped out and I had to, re, re, had to be replaced by my assistant. So I had to carry all that garbage myself. Um, and that kind of gives you an, an idea of my roles there, because I have the climbing stuff, I have my axes and my crampons so that I can climb myself. I have the eye screws that I actually gave to the, um, to the athletes. I have all the stuff here to ascend the fixed line, and here I'm not showing the ropes. And then I have the tripod for the camera, and I have the tripods for the lights, and I have the light, and I have the modifiers, and I have the flashes, uh, and the cameras, and the lenses. So uh, you can see you have to have many different roles at once. And um, it, it was extremely challenging because, uh, as you may be aware of, this is a terrible winter. We have very little snow, and we have even less ice. Um, and then what little snow we have usually uh, is very avalanche prone. So this was shot in Cannes, in Italy, in the Grand Paradiso Park. And uh, <clears throat> it was very, very challenging to find a route that had enough ice to be climbable, and that wasn't threatened by, uh, by avalanches. So we ended up kind of managing to align everything and have good weather. And this is uh, Jen Olson uh, from Canada looking at, the, uh, at half, of the, half of the climb. And here, so that's the first picture that I got. Um, and here, it's actually not night yet. It's kind of evening. There's still some light. So I'm balancing ambient light with, uh, you can't really see because this is pretty poor quality, but uh, it's actually warmer in here. And that's because I have a light right there that's shooting at the, and kind of lighting the ice. And ice, of course, is really interesting because it's very translucent and it can give very cool effects. And that's really what I was looking for. And so here, uh, the climber, Aurélien, is almost at the, the, the end of the first pitch, which is like five meters above him. And afterwards, I, well, Jen uh, and, and myself joined him. And, <clears throat> and I started getting the, the, the pictures that I was looking for. Um, and here, uh, I was supposed to have an assistant hold the light somewhere. And so I, was, I had no assistant. And Aurélien was busy belaying, and she was busy climbing. So I was one hand shooting, and then the other hand <laughs> In the, holding the light, which is actually something like five kilos. Um, so it was, you know, challenging, but in the end, it, 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 it works out sometimes. And here, uh, what I'm not too happy about is that this is very frontal. Um, so the light is coming from the same place as the camera, which is usually something you're trying to avoid. But in this case, you couldn't really avoid it. And you can still get an, an effect of the, of the ice. And... Uh, so they finished climbing, and I came down. Uh, and here I used the, the flash to eliminate the entire waterfall, uh, by, uh, but not enough that you would drown out drown the, uh, the headlamp beam, and kind of trying to balance that, balance the, uh, the, the headlamp that they're using so that you can see that it's night and that they're actually using headlamps, um, but still see uh, the waterfall. And then <clears throat> started climbing it again a second time. And this is when it's key to have models that are actually athletes that love what they're doing and that are not complaining about you asking them to just go back up, please. <clears throat> and this is the, those are the pictures that I came to shoot. Um, so ideally, what I had planned for was to have the assistant on a fixed line, top right, shoot and, and holding the light so that that, that would um, go down. Uh, on the climber, but that wasn't possible, so I actually left the light on the tripod at the bottom, and I used it to eliminate the entire waterfall, uh, but to be a lot weaker than the headlamp beam, so that you could really have this island of light idea. But if you're shooting that without the studio strobe at the bottom, then you're not seeing anything. You're just seeing a blob of white, which is the headlamp. And that's another one variation. And here again, you're also trying to go for a story. You're also trying to tell a story, and Again, you can't really see, but she's actually smiling. If you see the image in print, she's smiling, and you have the, the headlamp beam that's, that's looking up, and you have the ice axe. And you can see, what I'm hoping that people can see in her eyes is that, yeah, climbing at night, ice, this is cool. Um, and this is actually what she was thinking, so all good. <coughs> and this is the 
the last picture that I shot, um, and sometimes you go for black and white because it looks better. And again, this is all about the story and all about the, the light, the, the light going through the eyes. Um, and hopefully those images will appear in Sports Illustrated soon. Um, there we go. So now um, we have a little bit of time left. So I'm going to walk you through some of my favorite images uh, rather than talk uh, about a specific shoot. And then if we have some time left, which I doubt, I, I can tell you about uh, shooting Patagonian expedition races. Okay. There we go. So that's um, that's a picture I shot two years ago uh, while skiing to the top of Mont Blanc, uh, though we did not actually manage to, to go to the summit because my climbing partner and girlfriend um, got uh, altitude sickness. But this is an image. Um, that's something I really strive for. This is a very authentic image. It was a real moment. I mean, she, we were really climbing there. Nothing is staged, nothing is set up. And she did not even notice that I was shooting. She just kept on walking, kept on climbing. And that's something I'm really looking for um, in, in all I do. And of course, sometimes you have to compromise because the client expects you to get an image and you have to ask people to do stuff many times. But as much as possible, I'm trying to, uh, to really capture authentic moments. And this image works because of the contrast between the blue of the snow and of the, the cold world of early morning in the mountains, high mountains, that's about 4,000 meters of altitude, uh, and the warmth of the valley, the valley lines at the bottom, and of the sunrise that's coming up. <coughs> and that's an example of when you have to compromise a little bit, um, because this is uh, staged to an extent. Uh, this was shot on a, for the, the Petzl catalog. Um, and they wanted to shoot some uh, crevasse rescue uh, scenarios. Uh, and of course, to shoot the crevasse rescue, uh, you have to have somebody in a crevasse. So, uh, so I kind of asked, this is Liv Sansos who's falling into the crevasse, and she used to be the best woman climber in the world about 15 years ago, and now she does all sorts of crazy stuff, base jumping, steep skiing, paragliding, uh, mountaineering, you name it. Um, and I asked her to just please go into the crevasse, and I was expecting her to, I don't know, jump or try to find a way to walk down. But no, she just walked until the, the cone is collapsed and, and she fell down. So um, I just, just had enough time to raise my camera to my eye and capture that. Um, <coughs> and this is, that what's sad about it is that the, the picture was actually never used by Petzl because it's too negative for them. I mean, they used a lot of the pictures afterwards of us rescuing her, but somebody falling into a crevasse is not something they want to be associated with. Um. <laughs> and this one, um, so the picture that I showed two minutes later of those guys that you can kind of guess here coming up so that they're leading and I'm shooting them from above. Um, I shot exactly the same picture except you don't have the rope coming up. Um, and that was the cover of the Patagonia, Patagonia catalog in the US. Um, but I like this one better because that's my girlfriend. Um, and, uh, and you can see how happy she is of climbing here. And here, there's an example of uh, many, many times I go out and I do a climb and I bother having my big camera, big bulky camera on my harness, fully accessible, and I don't get a single good picture. Um, that happens all the time. But sometimes uh, it pays off to have it available, to have it really ready. And, uh, and that, that was one of those cases. So we, were, we had climbed on that day from the Grand Monte top station here, we had climbed that entire ridge and we actually bivied like half an hour later, very close to here. And then the next morning we went to the summit of Aiguille Verte. And, um, and I had shot some pictures on that day because I felt bad about not shooting any pictures, but that was basically the only reason. And they were really, really bad pictures. And then at some point I had just finished climbing and I was belaying and everything lined up perfectly. The clouds, the light, uh, the ridge, the faces, everything. And because I had a camera right there, I was able to, to take the picture. If it had been in a backpack, this picture wouldn't exist. Um, <coughs> so sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's always bothersome, uh, but sometimes it's worth it. And this is, yes. So this is a, a photo that was taken on an, an assignment for uh, the German brand Vaude uh, for the um, winter collection. And Vaudi, they have two different kinds of assignments. They have the ones where they know they need specific images and they hire somebody to shoot those specific images. And then they have the ones that they give to me, which I'm really happy about. And that's, here's some gear, here's some money, money to pay some models, and uh, please go and bring us back cool images. 
Um, and it's up to me to find the right conditions and to find uh, the right climb and to find the models and, and to find everything. <clears throat> and this is uh, all about serendipity uh, to an extent because this, this image I had no idea would exist up until about five seconds before I shot it. And, um, but it's also very challenging because, um, especially for clothing brands, uh, when you're shooting for them, usually they have some crazy schedules because they get the samples for the winter collection, for instance, in the case of Baudet, they get the samples on September 20th and they need the workbook to go to print on September 30th. So you have 10 days in late September to shoot the winter collection. And usually mountains in September do not look like winter. So in that case, we were lucky we got a storm before. Um, if you kind of forget about the very dry glacier in the background, you could believe it's winter. Um, we had to do the same uh, the other way around in early April last year, which was very, very snowy year, uh, shooting the summer collection. And then you had people skiing deep powder in Valley Blanche in the background, which you know is not something you usually do in August. Um, so it's also my job to you know make it look to use tricks to an extent to um, yeah to, to try and convey the right the right message about the, the pictures that the client wants. I, and in this case, this uh, we were, we got super lucky with uh, the weather as well because what happened here is that the clouds um, that were starting to roll in um, just started diffusing the the sunlight a little bit, and that what gives you this super soft. Um, light and then it's actually reflected in, in freshly fallen snow. So this is like having the world's biggest softbox just lighting the um, lighting your subject. And this is not something, I mean, if I was trying to replicate this, uh, it would take a crane basically holding some studio lights just above the frame. Um, yeah. No, this is, I do very, very little photoshopping. And I always, so that's of course a question that comes back all the time. Um, and I do, um, my post-processing is part of my image creation process. So I will uh, tune up the colors and the contrast and all of that. But I try, as I was saying earlier about authenticity, I always try to not cheat. And of course, the, you know, it's very personal decision. Um, and there's a line that I try not to cross. Basically, it's just answering to myself really. Uh, but no, so it, I could show you the original, and of course it looks a bit more dull, uh, but it's basically the same image. How about HDR? I don't. I don't. I used to use HDR to because sometimes in the mountains you have uh, very high contrasty scenes. With uh, modern sensors and with modern software, you don't need to anymore. With uh, especially the Nikon D800, which this was shot with, has such an insane dynamic range, and with Lightroom 5 now, uh, you can recover so much highlight and so much shadow that um, you don't need to use HDR anymore. All right, I'll start moving a little bit faster. Uh, <clears throat> so this is one of my very favorite images and one that I, I seem to be almost alone in really liking. Um, it, it, it's, very, uh, it's very subtle and, and it takes looking at it for quite a while before you start appreciating it, I think. And also it needs uh, to be printed well. And I'm sorry to say this is not the case here. But anyway, uh, w one of the themes of my photography often is um, trying to to communicate what I feel when I climb. And that's the reason I started shooting where, while I was climbing, while I was in the mountains. And one of the things that I feel very, very often is humility uh, in the mountains. Because you can think you the, the best climber, you can think that, that you, know, you can climb whatever, uh, and then <laughs> you will have a day where you will be reminded that you are nothing. And that's something I'm, I, I try to communicate sometimes. And here, having this looming mountain in the mist that without even trying, just completely overpowered the tiny human figure. Um, yeah, I don't know, it, it really talks to me. And this is actually Yamada Blam that's in, in Nepal. And this picture that's coming up. So this picture is straight out of camera. I have done nothing to it. The only thing is that it was slightly dark because my settings were not quite right. So I just brightened it a bit and that's it. And people do not believe me. I had even people tell me that they could see artifacts from the CGI that I had used. Um, <laughs> but um, this is high altitude light uh, with crazy snow conditions that you can find in the Andes. That's at uh, 6,300 6, meters of altitude. 
um, and you get this kind of uh, snow floodings and snow mushrooms in the Andes, especially in Peru. Um, and this is by far my best-selling picture. I shot that in 2009, and I've sold more prints of it than all of my other images combined. Um, Does the shutter stay here? What's that? Does the shutter stay here? I have no idea. I, I, this is shot at f8 because I always shoot at f8 until unless is I have. Is it like tripod or? No, 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 no. This is. I was coming down from the summit of the mountain. We had climbed another route, and I was at 6,000 meters, and I was completely wasted. But I saw that, and I had to stop. I don't think the rope even tightened because I, I always try to not bother the people that I'm roped up with. So I usually can even while walking you know, get a camera in and out. Uh, but this is F8 ISO 2, 200, I'm guessing, because that's the base ISO of the, the camera I was shooting and whatever the shutter speed is. Uh, my guess is around 250. I don't know, to be honest. No, 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 no. It's, uh, I think that's just because it's a poor quality projector. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, this is, a, this is a fast shutter speed. All right, quickly now. Uh, so this picture, uh, this is shot inside a crevasse uh, in Mer de Glace. And I was complaining earlier on the, the other ice climbing shoot about not having um, an assistant. Here, I didn't even have somebody to belay her. So I was actually belaying and shooting at the same time. Um, and of course, I'm shooting wide angle, so I'm actually, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 centimeters from her crampons. So I'm really hoping that she, <laughs> she doesn't uh, fall. Um, and here, I think, and, and of course, and this is also a very challenging lighting situation because the, the, the inside of the crevasse is very, very dark, and the outside is comparatively extremely bright. So here, I had to make a decision to uh, let completely go uh, details in the highlights at the top so that I could get all the interesting stuff that was going on uh, with the eyes at the bottom. And I think this, this one I really like for one reason is because it really shows, and here it's a little bit too dark, but you can kind of guess, when you're ice climbing, you climb, what you're actually standing on is usually half a centimeter, sometimes less. That's inside the eyes on, on two front points, sometimes one front point. Um, and here you can really see it. And that's something that often you can't. Um, and that's enough. You know, it works. Ice works. But when you actually see it, yeah, it makes you think a bit. Um, yeah, another image I like um, in, in Verdun, just playing with silhouettes and, and trying to have people build a story around the image and, and walk themselves. And that's a big difference between video and photos. In, a, in video, usually, you have to be a bit more explicit. Whereas in, with photos, with still photography, you have to let people guess and let people build an entire backstory and maybe front story even uh, about what's going on. And so here you have some people highlighting and some guy base jumping, doing a backflip, and some guy taking picture and it's sunset and you know, kind of asking why, but not. Um, I have another one later that's even more why. Uh, <clears throat> this is slightly new for me. I started shooting from my parent ladder. Um, when I discovered that I could actually do that, I was amazing. And, uh, and this is in Nancy. Um, and this one I just love because of the light. And it's, it's funny because it was actually a photo shoot. This guy with a yellow wing is a professional photographer and a good friend of mine. He's called, he's called Tristan Chu. And uh, he's shooting the designer of the wings that both Tristan and myself are flying uh, in this picture. And uh, this guy was doing crazy acrobatics. And Tristan was shooting him. <coughs> And sometimes, yeah, sometimes it works because it just looks cool. Uh, and um, so this is another authentic moment uh, on the nose of El Capitan coming down in a big storm. Uh, and here the story is very obvious. It's, you know, it's cold, it's wet, and you really don't want to be there. But you have to keep on going and keep on, uh, well, descending in that case. And this is often the case that, you know, everybody can shoot in when, when the weather is good and everything is going well. But... Um, if you keep shooting when things really go bad and people really don't want to be there, then that's when you get the, the good stories sometimes. And it's th the less you want to shoot, usually the more you should be shooting. Um, but of course, that always, usually when things go bad enough, there's a, there's a point where I have to put the camera away and just focus on, on the climbing or focus on getting out of there, uh, going to survival mode uh, sometimes. Is your camera uh, it has proven to be so far. 
it's a, I mean, pro cameras can take a lot of abuse, um, but except for the D4, and that would be the 1DX for Canon, um, which I'm specifically built to be waterproof, uh, that I still wouldn't throw in the ocean or anything, but um, the other ones, they will usually withstand abuse, uh, but sometimes they just won't. And, you know, you can't really know why. And I had some issues with the lens. Actually, pro lenses are supposed to be waterproof. I had some issues with uh, fogging inside and, and stuff going in. But cameras are tools, and I'd rather destroy my camera. Uh, I, I don't tell my insurance company that, but I'd rather destroy my camera and get the image than not get the image because I was worried about my gear. And this uh, this is also, I think, important. That's actually after the climb, and that's a direction I'm trying to go more and more in finding a human connection and not just showing the really cool move in a crazy landscape, but also showing, again, everything that goes into the, into the climb and, and what it takes to do the climb. And I was after a failure, a big failure on the nose. And that's, that's another case of a picture that's just been cool. Um, because this guy doesn't have any ropes, so he's, he's free soloing. Um, yeah, so it, it's just about being there and shooting the crazy guys. Uh, okay, I'll start speeding up a bit. Um, this is uh, on Ego de Midi, and uh, it's a very suggestive image. And it, it, it was a snapshot. I shot that because I just saw the, the mountain looking cool. And, uh, and I realized when I came back home that, uh, you know, this guy is looking up and when you, once you have, if you have a little bit more detail, it actually looks even better. Um, and that makes the image and sometimes you just have to be a bit lucky. Um, another image that was shortly before the guy descending, uh, descending from the nose, uh, super wet. So that was before we got wet. And, um, and yeah, so here the, the story, I think the way that he's leaning out is what makes the image work for me because he's looking at his, uh, his uh, leader and thinking, you know, hurry up, <laughs> let's get the hell out of here. Um, and this image is coming up. Yeah. So again, you know, you have to build stories sometimes. You have to let people build stories. And here I was shooting highlining, and this is the guy who was free soloing earlier, um, Mishke Meta. And then they started putting a hammock on, and I was like, yeah, sure, why not? And, and he started relaxing on, and then Armin came in and started playing didgeridoo, and I was like, yeah, okay, do your thing. <laughs> okay, um, very, very quickly, uh, which is not going to work because this thing takes 15 seconds to... Okay, I was going to uh, tell you about um, shooting um, adventure racing in Patagonia, which I've done two years in a row, and the race doesn't exist anymore now, uh, because it's really, really, really crazy to shoot down there. But uh, I think maybe we should keep some time for questions. Well, I'll go through them very quickly then. Um, so this is a rescue exercise. And the start by night, so that was the first year in 2012. Um, and this is a six to eight days race. They do 600 kilometers in complete wilderness and it's a wonder that nobody died yet. Um, and then kayaking. And of course penguins, because penguins. And there you go. And they're actually running. This is 36 hours into it, and they're running. And what, what I had to do was to uh, run with them. That's the only way to get the really good pictures, is, or to get better pictures than just staying at checkpoints, is to race with them. Um, and the, the reality of Patagonia is that once you start hiking in with them, you kind of have to finish that section with them. So I ended up, in that case, uh, walking 100 kilometers in 30 hours with them in complete wilderness, no trails, no nothing, which was very interesting. Um, so yeah. And then orienteering is the big, big uh, problem there. Um, that's how many teams lose, end up losing, uh, because the, the, the maps are terrible and there are no uh, landmarks usually to uh, orient against. Um, very wild terrain. Cross that river about 25 times maybe. And this is the kind of images that you cannot get if you're not in with them and if they don't trust you. And that was after 24 hours of sharing the suffering with them. They let me take that picture uh, of, you know, because usually when I get to the checkpoints, they all smile because they have like, I don't know, 10 checkpoints in, in the entire race. So they can change personae um, when they get there. Whereas that is what this race is about. It's about the suffering and it's about the pushing yourself through. And that's another one. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know if you can really see his face, but he doesn't look happy. And this is Patagonia, so it looks super good. Um, some cool landscapes. Uh, so um, this is not by far the worst case of it, um, but that's yeah. And that's and those guys will keep on working with that stuff. It's crazy. And then yeah, suffering. And that's Mark's face when he was told that they had finished. It's amazing. It's an eight days race, and those guys finished with 14 minutes to spare. So if they had been 14 minutes more, 15 minutes more, they would have been disqualified. Uh, no, it's pretty crazy. But they couldn't walk for like a week afterwards. Uh, and then tried to go climbing for myself, and that did not. Yeah, so did a BV, and then the next day I had to come down because 150 kilometers an hour winds. Uh, that's Patagonia for you. Then I came back last year again. Same thing, same deal. Let's keep moving a bit. Uh, shooting at night. That's the beginning. And then last year, within 24 hours, all but three teams had dropped out. Uh, there were, I think, 14 teams starting. Within 24 hours, 11 had dropped out. That's how tough it is. And yeah, this picture is funny because it's it's the only picture, this one, is the only picture I've actually sold of that race. And, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit depressing sometimes. Uh, and yeah, the crossing the, the Yellow Continental Sur, which is a crazy ass glacier. Um, and here trying to be a photographer, trying to, you know, have graphic elements and showing how huge it is. They told us in the briefing it's going to be 11 kilometers crossed in two hours, no crevasses. And we walked 29 kilometers and some of the biggest crevasses that I've ever seen. And those guys, most of those guys had never worn crampons before. It's just. None of them had eye screws. It was just ridiculous. Um, yeah. So this is, again, trying to be into the theme of we humans are very small things. Um, they were trying to find a crossing, uh, having some fun. That's, that were some of the teams that dropped out, uh, that we walked back with them. Yeah, because we did the 29 kilometers and then slept and then walked back 29 kilometers the other way. Um, and so we had a bit more time, so we, we just had some fun. And that's those guys are two fellow photographers, and I'm going to Greenland with, with this guy soon. Um, and Chris had gotten really badly burned after um, a small accident with a jet boil. And he still had to walk out. Even if you get badly injured, you still have to walk out. They, I mean, if it's life threatening, maybe the Navy will come and get you by helicopter. If not, you know, you walk. And he had something like 14 hours walk uh, on his really, really badly injured foot. Uh, yeah, kayaking, kayaking. So why did they all drop out? Uh, too late, usually too slow. Uh, so they're at checkpoints? Like yeah, they're time. checkpoints and they have time barriers. Um, and yeah, so getting into the water to try and get the shot. Um, this guy, and I'm trying to make the most of my time there. And this guy was um, a big uh, ranch owner, some gaucho pictures, you know, whatever works. And then the finish line you kind of have to get. And it's interesting because then you get the emotion. And that's something I'm always looking for in my pictures. Um, and I'm getting there. Cool. Went climbing afterwards, had some fun, took some bad images for clients. Uh, that's for Petzl. You know, they wanted the headlamps. So we shot the headlamps. There you go. And more headlamps that you can't really see. That's Serotori in the background. And uh, we tried to go climbing, and he, uh, yeah, so that's kind of an okay sunrise. Um, we tried to go climbing a rock route below Serotori, and it was 11 hours approach, and we bailed after 10 meters because it was too hard. I was climbing. Um, and that's tried again another time. And then Got that, that picture, um, which is also on the cover of the book. And same thing, I was actually climbing when I took that, but I had the camera, you know, there, accessible. And that was at the very end of the day when I really wanted to go back to the tent and sleep and not have to abseil yet again, uh, but didn't completely turn down the camera and the camera brain and 
uh, got that, which I think works really well. And sometimes you have to take really bad pictures for clients. And I was, yeah, charging the, the, the headlamp with uh, solar panels. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, right. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question is basically, what are the economics of it, um, and uh, and w whether I can make a good living at it or not? It's a very complex question to answer because there are there is no um, business plan for photographers. There's no single you know way of getting money. So I get money from a lot of different sources. One of them is assignments, where people pay me up front, and then I bring back the pictures. One way is uh, spec shoots. So I go out on my own time, I shoot, and then I send the pictures afterwards to uh, to the clients, and usually to Patagonia and Black Diamond and whatnot. Uh, and then they tell me, oh yeah, we like that, we're gonna, we're gonna buy it. The idea was like that. I paid my own money, and then I sold the pictures afterwards to the sponsors and to magazines. And then I also do fine art prints, um, which brings me a fair amount of money. Um, and uh, uh, being a photographer right now is very, very challenging. What saves me is that not, the, not that many people climb and not that many people do mountaineering. There are lots of climbers who shoot and lots of photographers who climb a bit, but not many people who do both uh, well enough that people will actually pay you money to do it. And I mean, there are some, and, and there's, uh, we are three just in Chamonix. Uh, and there's, of course, many more in Switzerland and Germany and, and France, but we are not that many. So that's kind of what saves me. And I'm making a decent amount of money. You know, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but I can sustain the lifestyle, and that's really what I'm looking for at the moment. Right, so the question is whether my pictures were stolen, and yes, every single day. Uh, they get stolen a lot. They usually don't get stolen too much by um, um, commercially, uh, so people are not making too much money from them that, that I wouldn't be seeing. Uh, that happens, though. I sometimes try to go after them. So if it's stuff like Pinterest or, or Tumblr or or just, you know, Russian sites always have those uh, 25 crazy images of 25 more spectacular, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't even bother sending DMCAs because what, what can you do? Um, it has happened to me a couple of times that people use them commercially and that I've managed to get money out of it. Yeah. Usually I send invoice up front, but most of the time, I shouldn't be saying this, but most of the time I'm bluffing. You know, I'm saying I'm going to explore my legal options is the wording I use. But my legal options, if the guy is in Russia or he, you know is in South America, is nothing. Um, so when it happens, the, the the one the few times where I've managed to actually get money for pictures that have been stolen was people I had talked to already who had asked me for uh, quotes. I had some quotes, and then they said no thanks, and then I found the images used anyway. And then I contact them and say, oh yeah, it was a mistake, blah blah blah, uh, and then they, then they've paid. But that's very rare. And I try, you know, I don't lose money. It's just money that I'm not earning. So I don't, I try not to spend too much time thinking about it. Um, but yeah, it's it's a reality of how the internet works, basically. And I, I use often uh, reverse searches with Google Images to find uses. Uh, so whoever's involved in that, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, go for it. Right. Uh, so the question is about uh, ratio of good to bad images. Um, it's, it's, it really varies. On a typical shoot, I will shoot maybe, I don't know, a, a thousand pictures in a day. And of those, I will try to take no more than 10 or 15. And that's actually a pretty high number. Um, I will usually narrow that down even more to three or four. Um, and self-editing is one of the hardest bits. But I, I wouldn't be able to put a definite figure to, to tell you it's 2% or it's 10%. All I can tell you is that for me, as for every single photographer, even, even Ansel Adams and Robert Dono and whoever you put a photo here is, has tons of garbage in, in the files. But the trick is to just never show it to anybody. Is there a difference in the amount of good pictures when you have like different 
plan or intention? Um, well, I, especially with climbing, you always, it's different than shooting in a studio because you can pl you can only plan so much. Like I, I made very advanced plans for the, the ice climbing shoot the by night thing, and then everything fell down fell out right away pretty much. So I had to improvise. Um, usually when I make plans, I do get the image that I had planned, hopefully, and then I try to improvise. Um, so I, wouldn't, I don't think there is a very big difference. Yeah. So the way I sell prints is the finite world, finite, fine art world is very weird in that value is completely disconnected from uh, the, the value of the physical object of the print. So if I was selling a print at 50 euros, people would think, oh, this, is, this print is worth 50 euros. If I sell the print like I do now, uh, it starts at 500 euros for A3, um, people will automatically think, oh, this must be a really good print. And you know, of course, if you're Damien Hirst and you start pricing your stuff at 15 million euros, people think, oh, that's because he's an amazing artist. You know, even though the, the print actually cost me the same as if I was uh, selling it 50 euros. So I made a conscious decision to position myself in the, in the very high end, um, simply because I guess I could get the same kind of uh, revenue if I was selling um, 10 images at 50 euros as if I was selling one at 500, give or take. But it takes me a lot less time to, uh, and a lot less energy to be dealing with, uh, with images that are on the high end. So uh, the way concretely how it works is just I have a page that's called prints on my website. And I, on it, I say, uh, email me for details. And then I, I get back to them with prices. And usually, you know, 98% of the people don't even reply because it's too high. And that's just the way it is. Um, but then the 2% that reply, yeah, the one that actually make money from. But that's a very small part of my income. Uh, it, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to leave off finite prints. Do you outsource the printing? Yeah, I use, well, I outsource it in that uh, I do a lot of very big prints because usually when people don't bulk at your figure of 504 3 they actually want two meters wide, which is going to be 2,000 euros or something. Um, and then printers for that kind of sizes are very, very expensive. Um, and I don't have the skills as well to make a really good print. So I use uh, Picto as do many, many French Uh, professional photographers, which is a professional lab in Paris that prints for museums and prints for exhibitions. So I know that the, the service is really uh, tough. So you don't work with photo agencies at all? I, uh, no, so stock agencies, no. Uh, I, I'm, well, technically yes, but I'm, uh, the contract is almost run out and I will not renew it. And I've stopped submitting stuff there uh, ages ago. I do work with price agencies. When I get pictures like the free selling ones, I had them uh, run into many newspapers through a press agency because I don't have the contacts. But stock agencies, uh, it's a volume game. And usually the stuff that sells is the very generic stuff. And I try not to shoot generic images. Um, so stock is a dead end for most people. And to, I mean, I know some people who make a very good living from stock, but it's a full-time job. It's soul sucking really, because you have to spend a lot of time keywording and shooting bland stuff. Um, and, and it just, yeah, it's a, it really is a full-time job, and I'm not interested in that. And I don't even shoot the right stuff anyway, so. Yeah? Can you say something about your decision process to uh, switch careers? Right. Uh, I hated computer science. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, so I come from the same school as Benoit, which is uh, an S in France. Um, And uh, I started a PhD. Well, I really hope that some people will not watch that recording. Uh, but I started my PhD, and I was starting not to like the, f the, the stuff I was uh, studying anymore. And I st basically stopped caring about, you know, whether my proofs were valid or not. Um, and um, but I finished the PhD, and I had the nicest kind of supervisor ever, because he should have kicked me out within a year. Uh, but he kept on with me, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but I basically told myself that I'm going to finish the PhD, and then I'm going to try to do something else because I'm not happy. Uh, and something else, the, the only thing I had a chance of making money with when I finished my PhD was actually photography. So I just thought, you know, I'm going to be living in Chamonix for a year and see if I can make it work out. Uh, and it turned out I could. So uh, the experiment is ongoing, and I'm hoping that I won't come back in five years asking for a job here. Uh, yep. But this is the 
said that uh, you finished with the school in 2011, and in the same year you published two books? Yeah. Uh, so I did not work very much on my PhD, <laughs> <laughs> is the short answer. Uh, and that, that was actually really key for me, was to be able to spend all that, those three years of PhD, I was really, you should say, I was a semi-professional photographer. I was not taking assignments, but I was really building a network of clients, and I was spending time on my website and spending time on my marketing and writing books. Um, and that's that allowed me to uh, jump into it right away and to already have that network of clients and to already have that name recognition when I uh, when I had to rely on photography solely to pay my rent. Um, before that, I had those three years where my rent was paid by my PhD. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if, when you go on an assignment and um, the conditions aren't right or you feel like you're not getting any support, right. I mean, like, how do you balance the stress that you need to go back to it's, I mean, they trust you to, to find ways to make it work. Um, usually the clients, uh, at least the clients I have at the moment were, who are um, outdoor clients, so they are climbers and skiers themselves, so they know that the conditions sometimes aren't right. Um, but it's my job to uh, it's my job to get them the images back, and usually uh, I, you know I try my best and I always have something to bring back. Um, and there was one situation, one case, the pencil shoot actually. Um, it was a two-day shoot, and on the first day I brought back some images that they wanted, but it turned out that it wouldn't work with the layout that they had because in the catalog they needed very narrow images, uh, and none of them would work. Um, and I was kind of in the brief, so it was. It was technically my fault, so I just uh, did a reshoot a couple of days later, uh, and I paid the models myself. Um, so you know, whatever it takes. My job is to make the client happy. They're trusting me to bring them back the images, and my livelihood depends on not uh, disappointing them. So. But it's extremely stressful. And for instance, the, the Sports Illustrated shoot was an absolute nightmare in terms of logistics. Um, and you know, I did not sleep for like a week before that actually happened. Because I was too stressed about all the details, everything that could go wrong, and but usually, you know, mountains are good-looking. You're shooting good-looking people. <laughs> you can you, you can bring back images. And you mentioned that uh, most of your income doesn't come from pictures. Is it from assignments? Yeah, I would say it's about 50-50. I don't have the figures, but it's 50% assignments and 50% spec shoots that I sell afterwards. And then I have a lot of uh, clients completely unrelated to the outdoors. Sometimes, uh, actually, quite a lot of bankers because monitoring images uh, speak to them. You know, the whole uh, um, challenging yourself and reaching summits and <laughs> being in a rogue team, blah blah blah. Uh, so they love that stuff, and um, and I get inquiries very often from people uh, who are, uh, yeah, who want to buy images and who are into finance or into whatever. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the question is about how to carry the camera while I'm climbing, and it is one of the questions I'm asked most frequently. Um, there is no good solution. That's the, the basic of it. Um, I use two different systems. One of them is the, it's called a think tank skin, and it is a belt with uh, pouches that you can, just small bags, that, uh, that you can compress when they're not in use, and then you can, it's very modular. So you can just have the one for the right size of camera and lenses. And I don't use backpacks and I don't use chest straps because they hide my feet. And when I'm skiing or climbing, I have to see my feet. And that stuff, can, I can kind of rotate them out of the way and it can keep my balance more or less right. Um, the other system I use is called, it's uh, from a company called Peak Design. It's the capture camera clip. Um, and it's, uh, it's a small clamp that you put on a harness or on a backpack. And then you can just take the camera in or out. And both systems do not protect the camera at all. So I send my lens, my wide-angle lens, I send it to Nikon every six months because the front element is shattered. Um, but it's, as I was saying earlier, it's a tool. But yeah, it's a, it's a big bulky thing. Um, and uh, it's heavy, it's fragile, and you're doing crazy stuff. And there's no good solution. There's no great solution. There are OK solutions to carry a camera. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks very much. And then I'm going to be here for the evening, I guess, if you guys want to chat or take a look at the book. Thanks very much.